Welcome to Microsoft 365 Excel, The Complete Story. And in video number 12, wait a second. We've already studied lots of Power Query. But guess what? You don't know Power Query until you know M code. M code is the case sensitive functional language behind everything we do in Power Query. Not only that, but the next three MEX video are all going to be about Power Query. Once we learn M code, then we can use lots of those tricks to learn how to import data better and use features like joins, group by, and unpivot. Here's the list of topics we're going to cover in this video. And the absolute most important things to M code is understanding values, the let expression, M code lookup, custom functions, and the amazing each and underscore. And don't forget about the PDF notes. There are some parts of these notes with their diagrams that might even be better than the video. Now, first things first. Of course, what is Power Query? Well, we've studied this a lot. It is a tool to import, clean, transform, and load data. Microsoft calls this tool Data Mashup. That M in Mashup is where they got the M when they decided to call this case-sensitive function-based language M code. Now, luckily, Power Query is in Excel and in Power BI Desktop. It is not in Power BI Online, although there's something similar called data flows. We will not cover data flows. We'll cover Power Query. Now, here's the full Microsoft M code specification guide. If you want to go check that out, it's got every single teeny detail about how M code works. Now, in Power Query, M code basically does one thing. It delivers values. And we'll come back to this full list here. But this is the list of all 15 values. These are the things that Power Query can work with and that it can deliver. And what makes Power Query and M code different than other languages, like worksheet formulas and DAX formulas in the data model, is that M code is specifically designed to deal with things like tables, records, lists, and something called binary, which means we can actually work on files, like Excel files and text files. And of course, if we're going to have a tool that does data mashup, then of course, we have to be able to work with these types of objects. Now we'll go through every single one of these values one by one. But we'll do that a little bit later in the video. Now, because Power Query is in Excel, data ribbon tab, Get and Transform Data and Queries and Connection Groups, that's Power Query. But it's also in Power BI Desktop. Data and Queries, that makes up Power Query. Now, I have the tables that we're going to work with in two different files. If you'd rather work in Power BI Desktop or over in Excel, you can work with either one of these files. Now, there are some slight differences. And when there are, I'll point that out. Now, to open the Power Query Editor, we can go to Get Data, Launch Power Query Editor. And this is what the editor looks like in Excel. It has one, two, three, four different tabs. Over here in Power BI Desktop, we go to Queries, Transform Data Dropdown, Transform Data. There are six tabs, actually, Home, Transform, Add Column, View, Tools, and Help. But this together makes up the Power Query Editor over in Power BI Desktop. Now, as we talked about a number of times before, Close and Apply is different over here in Power BI Desktop. Close closes the editor. Apply loads this to the only place it can go, the data model. Now, for all of these queries, I don't want to load them to the data model. So I went to each query and right click, unchecked Enable Load. This is the same as over in Excel, selecting only Create Connection. And over here in the Power BI Desktop file, I loaded all of the different tables we're going to use. Over here in Excel on Excel Table Sheet, we'll start our study of M code by importing this table and doing a simple transformation. 
Now for this video, I'm going to work mostly over in Excel Power Query. But if you want to work in the Power BI desktop file, here's how you get to the same table. We're in Home, Queries, Transform Data, Transform Data. And I've already imported these tables so you can select the table. Here's the table we're going to be working with for a lot of this video. And really, the only difference you need to be aware of is when I talk about names, applied step, formula bars, and advanced editor, you have to realize that the advanced editor button is just in a slightly different location over here in Power BI Desktop. Over in Excel, it's right about there in the Home ribbon. But I do want to show you one other difference. I imported most of these from Excel but I did not leave a connection. I actually said, hey, copy the data into Power BI Desktop. And if you go to the Source Step, click to open the Formula Bar, and the Source Step is going to look a lot different than how we do it in Excel. And what I did to create that first huge Source Step is I clicked Paste Data into a blank table. And after copying the Excel table, I simply Control V, name the table, and then click Edit. And that's what created this hard-coded JSON file. Now, later, we'll definitely learn how to import a JSON file, not hard-coding it. But just like we have CSV, text, XML, we also have JSON file sources that we need to import sometimes. All right, I'm going to collapse this. And you can work over here. I'm going to jump back over to Excel. Now to get an Excel table into the Power Query Editor, we go up to Get and Transform. And actually, from Table Range brings in Excel tables, spilled array formulas, and defined names. Now instead of using this button, there's a great keyboard. Find the right-click key, and then down at the bottom, you can see that underline G. So the keyboard is right-click G. This is the Power Query Editor. There are different tabs. For each tab, there's a bunch of commands. On the left, this is a list of all the queries in this Excel workbook file. Since we have day type sales selected, this is the output for the query. In the Query Setting pane, this is the name of the query, also known as the identifier. These are the steps for this query in the Applied Steps list. So far, all we have is the automatic steps created. These are also called identifiers. And before we look at M code, I want to add a new step. And then we'll dive into M code. Now what we want to do is create a grouping report, which will group workday, weekday, holiday, and so on, and then add the sales. Now that sounds like a pivot table, but in Power Query and in the SQL database computer language, we use the Group By feature to group together records and then make some aggregate calculation or some other grouping calculation. To group by a particular column, we select the column, go up to Home, Group By, or we can simply right click Group By. In the Group By dialog box, when we select Basic, we get one column name, which creates the unique list and one aggregate calculation. We can also select Advanced and then have as many conditions as we would like and as many calculations as we'd like. We'll leave it as Basic. That's the field that's going to create the unique list. The name of the new column, we'll call it Total Sales. The operation on the grouped records is going to be Sum. And amongst those group records, we only want to look and sum based on the sales column. Now when I click OK, this is going to add a new step. We have one, two automatic steps and a step we created. Now there are three places that you can view and change the M code directly. Applied Steps, up in the Formula Bar, and Advanced Editor. To see this in action, Here's Group Rows. That's the name of the query step. Up in the Formula Bar, that's the M code formula associated with that query step name. And if we come up to Advanced Editor, this is where we can see all the M code in one place. And sure enough, there's Group Rows. There's the formula. Now we'll come back to exactly what this let statement means. By the way, 
It's very similar to the Excel worksheet let function we learned about two videos ago. Now let's change the M code using applied steps. I'm going to click on Group Rows, hit F2, and all we're going to do is change the name of the query step. So I'm going to backspace and remove that space. When I hit Enter, it's changed in Applied Steps. Nothing has changed in the formula. But when we come up to Advanced Editor, sure enough, that reflects the change. Now we want to talk about something really important for identifiers. There's the identifier for the complete query. And we have one, two, three query steps, each with an identifier. Notice step three and one have no spaces, but step number two has a space. And why in the world in M code do we have to use a pound sign before the double quotes and then the identifier inside? Well, the reason is because text already took up double quotes. When you use double quotes with some text inside, Power Query, just like the Excel worksheet, interprets that as text. So to distinguish an identifier from text, you have to put a pound sign before the double quotes and the name. However, to make it easy on ourselves and make the M code easy to read, for all of our identifiers, whether they're query names or step names, I'm going to click Done. Select Change Type F2, and we want to rename it without a space. I'm going to type Add Data Types. Let's just make it easy on ourselves and never use spaces. Now when I come up to Advanced Editor, that is much easier to read. Now let's click Done. Another way we can use Applied Steps to change the M code is if we see a step with a gear icon, that means there's a dialog box we can open up and change this step. Now let's select Group Rows, and I want to look up in the formula bar. Here's our M code formula, table.group, that's the function. The first argument is acting on the previous step because we want to do some transformation to that previous step. The second argument in list syntax, and we'll learn all about list syntax coming up. But that's the field where we grouped. And then the next argument is a list within a list. And you can see in this interior list, there's the name of the calculation. For each row in the grouped records, there's the sum function. And it even assigned a decimal or number data type. Now all we're doing right now is just noticing that's the automatic M code. Now let's come down, click the gear icon. And we want to change the M code using the dialog box. Let's click Advanced. I want to add an aggregation. We want to call this new column something like Average Sales. We're going to use the aggregate function Average. And we're going to work on the Sales column. When I click OK, there it is. In List Syntax, we can see the three inputs for our second aggregate calculation. There's the name of the field. There's the calculation. The data type is 1.2 or decimal. I'm going to click at the end and hit Enter. I go up to Advanced Editor. And sure enough, there's the new M code. Let's click Done. So we can use Applied Steps to change the M code. But we can also directly type into the formula bar. So I have Group Rows selected, and I change my mind. I don't want the title of the new column to be Av. I want it to be average. So I change the M code in the formula bar, click at the end, and Enter. And sure enough, the output from the query has changed. If I come up to Advanced Editor, the M code up here changed. And look at that. I typed it incorrectly. So of course, we can absolutely change the M code up here. I'm going to backspace, click Done. It's reflected there. And one, two, three three different places where we can view and alter the M code. Now, we want to talk about the let expression inside of Power Query. So let's go up to Advanced Editor. And anytime you create a query and use the user interface, it's always going to use this let expression. Now, in Video 10, we use the let worksheet function. And we defined a variable name, typed a comma, and then the formula element typed a comma. We entered as many variables as we wanted. 
And then at the bottom, we created the calculation, which is the output for the let function. Here in Power Query, it's similar. We start with let, lowercase. Not only that, but that's called a keyword. Things like let, in, type for data type. You're not allowed to use those for anything except for the let statement to define a data type and so on. So the let expression always starts with lowercase let. And then there's the query step name or identifier, an equal sign. There's the formula. And then there's a comma. When you type a comma into the let statement, it means it's going to deliver this as an intermediate step. And we saw that over in Applied Steps where we could click back and forth between the different steps and see the output. So we have a comma. There's the identifier, equal sign, M code, comma, query step name, equal sign, and there's the M code. But at the end of the let statement, before we decide what we want the query to deliver, the last step cannot have a comma. When you do not type a comma, it then expects for you to put in and the output. Now, it's almost always whatever the last step is. But you can put any one of the steps here. And in fact, you could type the number 43 or put any other query name. But the let, identifier, equal sign, M code, a bunch of commas. The last step doesn't have a comma. In, and then there's the output. Now another term we want to define is the term expressions. And an expression is any M code that delivers a Power Query value. So for example, this table.group function is delivering a table, so that's an expression. This list is delivering a list, which is one of the Power Query values, so that's an expression. When we have numbers in a math operator, well, that delivers a single number, which is a Power Query value, so that's an expression. Back over here with our let expression, well, of course, even the let expression is an expression because it's delivering a Power Query value. In this case, the result of table.group, which is a table. Now, one last thing. Just like the let function that we created in the worksheet, any variable that we create can only be used inside the let expression. However, we can certainly pull other queries into the let statement. Click Done. Now from page 10 in our PDF notes, here's your cheat sheet for the let expression. Lowercase let, variable name equals M code. If you do a space, you're going to have to get fancy with that syntax. Variable name equals M code all the way to the end, no comma, in and output. And the output is almost always the last variable, but it can be anything. Now, we just learned how the let expression is automatically created when we create any query. Later, we'll see that the let expression can be used in any M code to define a variable that you need to use. But in either case, this is your cheat sheet for let. Now, we got to talk about what happens when we insert a step into the applied steps. If I select source and insert a step right here, one of two things happens. Either that step works perfectly with the remaining steps in the query, or it causes errors. Now let's look at two examples. I have source selected. I want to come up and rename this, so I double click, type of day, and enter. We can see table.rename columns, but sure enough, the subsequent steps already have the previous column name, and both of these steps are using it. Now, in a situation like this, we have a few options. We can actually edit the M code in both of the steps. And when we do that, there it's working. Or probably a better option, if I re-edit this, is to not put the step here, but put it at the end. Now we can certainly insert steps and delete steps. When we delete steps, the same scenario arises. If we delete this, is it going to hurt the remaining steps? In this case, it's not. So I click the red X, delete, come to the last step. I can double click and type of and enter. And sure enough, that is working. 
Now let's delete this step, and I want to look at the second scenario. Here's a step, and we definitely have a gear icon, which means I can click it. And by using the Group By dialog box, it automatically writes the M code for the table.group function. But the thing is, we're only using three of the arguments. And if you use this dialog box, it only allows you to change three of the arguments. And we want to use the fourth argument in table.group, so that means we're going to have to manually type the code. We cannot use this dialog box. Now I'm going to click OK, and we're going to change the M code. And then that will require that we insert a new step. Now we're going to learn something about the gear icons and the default settings. If I come up to table.group, and actually if you look over here, what table.group does by default is it takes all of the work days, groups them together, and then gives you some aggregate calculation. But we can use the fourth argument in table.group. And instead of taking all the work days, it only takes consecutive days. And sometimes that's exactly what you want. Now I want to come to the end. And when I type a comma, the screen tip pops up and it says group kind. But it doesn't give us any real good hints about what this does. Now in a moment, I'll show you how to search online or internally inside the Power Query Editor to get help with arguments like this. Now the default is what we have here. But if we put a 0 into group kind, then when I hit Enter, it groups by consecutive occurrences. Now when we group by consecutive occurrences, that actually is depending on the date column sort. So if someone comes over here and sorts this table biggest to smallest, that will wreck this report. So what do we want to do? We want to insert a step. But before we insert a step here, I want to go learn something important about the let statement and M code. Advanced Editor, and notice the step group rows is using table.group. But this line of M code is trying to transform or change the previous step somehow. So almost always, the first argument of whatever M code function we're using, or just straight M code, has the name of the previous step. And the cool thing is, when we insert a step right here, this line of M code will update. It will no longer be looking at add data types. It will be looking at our sort step. Click Cancel. So I click the step above. And I want to make sure that the date column is always sorted A to Z. I definitely want to insert a step right there. Click Insert. And so now our second example of inserting, it's not going to hurt any of the subsequent steps. In fact, it's going to help. Now that we've inserted a step, when we go up to the Advanced Editor, the M code has adjusted. Table.group records is now looking at the previous step. Table.sort is also looking at the previous step. Click Cancel. Now we'll come back and talk a lot more about table.group function two videos ahead when we talk all about group by. Now one thing about M code is there are over 700 built-in functions. So a lot of times we have to go out and search for information about a particular function. And one way to get information about functions is to go to Google and search table.group. And we might put Power Query to make sure it gets the M code. And sure enough, there it is. It describes the five different arguments. And it has some notes here that are actually not very good. But it does mention groupkind.local. That's what we actually did when we put a 0 to group by consecutive records. So we can search by groupkind.local. Back in Google, I'm going to search for groupkind.local. There it is. And sure enough, this is a much better description than we saw in either of the other two places. Groupkind.global, that's the default. Groupkind.local, that's what we used with the 0. A local grouping is formed from a consecutive sequence of rows which is exactly what we wanted. Now let's jump back over to the Power Query Editor. And searching through Google to get directly to Microsoft site is great. But here's a great trick. I have the last step selected. 
And temporarily, I want to insert a step because I want to get some information about a function. When you insert a step, it says custom one. It also automatically thinks you want to do something to the previous step. But I don't want to. I'm going to type table.group. And IntelliSense inside of Power Query is horrible. If I had hit Enter there, it would have put the wrong thing in. So I'm going to click at the beginning and Enter. And sure enough, here's a bunch of help about table.group. Another great trick for searching for whatever you might want inside a Power Query, we can type lowercase shared. Actually, it has a pound before it. And when we do that, it turns red. Because when we hit Enter, it gives us a record with over 700 entries. If we come up, notice it says records. If we convert this to a table, we can then search through the entire column. Let's say we want to look for group items. And there it is, group kind global local table group, even a fuzzy one. All right, I'm going to click Escape on Custom 1. Right click, delete until end, delete. Now I did the same thing over in our Power BI desktop file. And whereas there's 837 standard library items over in Excel, over here in Power BI Desktop, there's 1,082. And in large part, that's due because Power BI Desktop has a lot more connectors to external data sources, like these Google connectors here. All right, with all of that background M code knowledge, now we want to talk about the heart of M code, which is all the values that Power Query can deliver. There are 15 different values. Now, if you're going to work in the Power BI Desktop Power Query file, select this query with this step selected. Over in Excel, we'll do the same thing with the group rows selected. Now, here's the crazy thing. We're actually going to just use this query and create a bunch of steps, delete steps, just play around over here experimenting with values. Now, we'll look at null logical text and number first. Now, these types of values are usually imported as part of a data set, or we type them directly into formulas. But I want to add some steps here and show you what is called a literal. That's how we hard code the value into the M code. I want to insert a step up in the formula bar. We'll start with NULL, -L, that's null, that's the absence of data. It is like an empty cell in Excel. Now, right now, if I hit Enter, it puts this in. The IntelliSense in Power Query is horrible. So I'll move my cursor to the beginning and Enter. Click the F of X, highlight, and watch this. I'm going to type lowercase true. That's how it appears in the M code, but when I Enter, it shows the Boolean value capitalized, f of x. And we'll type some text and Enter, f of x. And I'm going to type a number, Enter. I'll rename these. Now let's go up to Advanced Editor. It automatically put in the syntax that says this is an identifier. Now watch this. Because Power Query is case sensitive, if I type capital N-U-L-L, -L, that is not one of the keywords. Also notice that although true and false appear capitalized in the M code, you always have to enter it lowercase, either true or false. Number, that's a keyword, but because I have it capitalized, it works as an identifier. Now I'm going to put a V at the each one of these to keep this convention. V is for value. Those are the first four values. I'm going to click Done. And of course, it's polite. It's reminding me that number wasn't recognized. When I click Advanced Editor, sure enough, the last step here, I renamed it. But I forgot to come to After In and fix that name. Now I can click Done. Now 5 to 9, time, date, date, time, date, time, zone, and duration. How we enter them as hard-coded values or as literals is much different than over in Excel. I'm going to click F of X, and up in the formula bar, we do pound, time, and lowercase. And then there's three arguments, hours, comma, minutes, comma, seconds. 
And now when I hit Enter, whoa, it shows exactly as the time value should. Now look at that. Just like we saw the true capitalize, that's different here. But if we come up to Advanced Editor, that's the hard-coded M code that's required. Click Done. Click F of X. Now for date, that's how we enter it. And it's going to be year, month, and day. But there's something really exciting about Power Query as compared to the Excel worksheet and DAX. We can go from January 1st, 0001, all the way to December 31st, 9999. So I'm going to type the year 1598, January, the 15th. And when I hit Enter, sure enough, that's going to be recognized as a date. Historians have long been not happy with the Excel worksheet because you couldn't put historical dates in. But in Power Query, you can definitely do that. F of X. There's date time with year, month, day, hour, minutes, and seconds. So when I enter this, there's the date time. Hit F of X. Now, this is date time zone, and it's going to represent the universal coordinated time. And in this case, we have everything that's in date time. But this is an offset, either positive or negative, hours and minutes. So when I hit Enter, this will say plus 9. And sure enough, there it is. The last one is exciting. This is duration. This is just an amount of time where we have days, hours, minutes, and seconds. But when I hit Enter, there's one day, one hour, and 10 minutes. If I rename and go up to Advanced Editor, here's the first nine values we're going to look at. And each one of these values delivers a single item. The remaining values we'll look at, like table, record, list, those all contain multiple different items. Now we looked at how to hard code the first nine Power Query values into M code. And much of the time, we'll be getting these values as part of a data set in a table. Now we want to go look at a couple examples of how we might use these first nine values in M code. Now I click Done on the Advanced Editor, and I want to select the last step. And we want to learn something really cool about these variables in a let statement. I can pull group rows down below here and just leave these as intermediate steps that we're not necessarily going to use anywhere else. So I select the last step, come up to f of x, type in the formula bar, group rows, and Enter. If we look at the advanced editor, even though we created the step up here, it's just a variable. And we're using it down here. That's true for any of these variables. We can use them anywhere throughout the let statement. Done. Let's add a new column. So I go to Add Column. And I want to add a custom column. And we're going to name this new column. Workday sales greater than or equal to 3,000. And what we want to do is I want to create a formula here that uses the first four values. And I want to use the if function or if expression. And I want to ask the question for each row is type day equal to workday and are total sales greater than or equal to 3,000. Now the way we do if is much different than in Excel. We type lowercase if, no open parentheses. We want to access the item for each row in type day. So I come over to Available Columns, double click. Those square brackets are called field access operators, because for each row, it's going to pull the correct row item. And we type equals to, and the first Power Query value we're going to use is text, Workday in double quotes. And we want to run an AND logical test. We don't use the AND function. We use lowercase AND. Then we want to ask the question of total sales. Ask, are you greater than or equal to? And now we'll use our second Power Query value on number. And we type a space. In Excel, in the if function and DAX2, we type a comma. And this would be value if true. But here in M code, we say then. 
And we want a Boolean value, so lowercase true. Then in Excel and DAX, we type comma, value if false. Here we do else. And I want null, no close parentheses. So we have values, text, number, Boolean, and null. Click OK. And that is working. Now let's make this M code even more efficient. Notice I pulled group rows down and then built this formula, which is looking at the previous step. But I don't need to do that. I can just build this step and point this first argument directly to group rows. I see it there, so I hit Tab, Enter. Now I can come down and X this step out, Delete. I'll rename the step and go to Home, Advanced Editor. And sure enough, there's our last step. Table.addColumns is looking directly up at group rows. It's totally allowed to do that. Now, another great trick in Power Query and M code is you can actually copy and paste this M code wherever you'd like. I'm actually going to copy everything from the second step all the way down to the bottom, Control-C. If I had selected everything, including the top, Cancel. You could come over and right click New Query, Other Sources, Blank Query. It starts out here like we're going to type something, but you come up to Advanced Editor, Highlight and Paste. But that's not what we want to do here. Now, if I want to close the editor, I have not loaded this yet. So I have to come up to Close and Load, Close and Load 2, Only Create a Connection. And I want to make a parallel to Power BI Desktop Power Query. Over there, you're allowed to close the editor without actually applying any changes. So if we were over there, we wouldn't have to actually load it as a connection only. And I'll show you that in just a second. But now our query's there. We can come back later. If we had the full let statement and we wanted to paste it into a new query here in the Excel file, Get data from other sources, and there it is, blank query. Over here in Power BI Desktop Power Query, we have day type, sales, and a bunch of you are working over here, so you have all these steps. But I don't have them all, and I just want to copy them from Excel. So I go up to Advanced Editor, and I've saved everything from the second step down. We can see our source is hard-coded JSON. Over in Excel, our source was an Excel table. So I'm simply going to highlight. And both queries start with source as the first variable or step, so I can Control V. And this step, except for the tab, which I'm going to do right here, it's already looking at source. All the rest of the steps will work. I click Done. There they are. Now in Excel, if you want to close the Power Query editor, you have to load it somewhere. You can't just close it and come back later. But in Power BI Desktop Power Query, we can simply use the Close button, and it will close just the editor. So I'm going to select Close. Everything is still saved. I go back up here, Transform Data. It's all still there. And here in Power BI Desktop, the file, if I want to get rid of it, I can. Otherwise, I can apply the changes. That's actually a big difference between Power Query and Power BI Desktop and over in Excel. I'm going to click Apply Changes. Now our next step is I want to look at some date and duration examples. I already actually imported this table as a connection only. So over here in Excel, we can just open the editor and start working. But in Power BI Desktop, I haven't loaded this yet. But I want to show you how to copy and paste data into Power BI Desktop. Because over here in Excel, we have the freedom of a worksheet. We can store data here. We can do anything we want. Now over in Power BI Desktop, the anything we want in the worksheet, that's the part we can't do over there. But we can copy and paste data. So I'm going to copy this. And here it is in Power BI Desktop, paste data into a blank table. I click. I use Control V to paste. There it is. I name the table, click Edit, come over, right click, uncheck Enable Load. So those of you using this file can now work over here. In Excel, I'm going to double click Duration Example. 
Now, the first example of working with dates is awesome because over in Excel, we don't have dates before January 1st, 1900. Now, that date right there is January 15th, 1598. And I actually have no idea how to show the full year. But in some cases, when we're building date tables and date attributes, we need to extract from a date the year. So I select the date go up to Add Column, and there's all sorts of amazing Add Column commands for date, time, and duration. I'm simply going to say Year. And you got to be kidding me, 1598, and I have this set to 0001. So that's the year one. Now, when we're dealing with dates and times and durations, Power Query doesn't really let us do things like subtract two dates to get number of days. And the reason why is this is a date value, and number of days is a whole number. But over in Excel, we could simply subtract the two dates and remove the number formatting, and the number would be revealed. Over here in Power Query, if we take n minus start, we get a duration, not the number of days like we're after. That's not a problem, because there's a bunch of functions that can take the result as a duration and convert it back to a number. Also, if we take end and add a number of days, in Excel we can do that calculation directly. But here, these are different values. So we're going to have to use a special function to deal with the different data values and deliver what we want, a new end date. So anytime you're making calculations across different Power Query values, or different Power Query data types, you may not always get what you want. But almost always, there's some function to come to the rescue. Now, the first thing we want to do is take n minus start. And we want to see that, in fact, this will give us a duration. New column, custom column. I'm going to call it number of days nf. And we'll see why nf in just a moment. Let's just take n minus start. Click OK. And it sort of gives us what we want, but this is a duration. And only the first part, the number of days, are showing. Let's click the gear icon. Now there's a great function called number.from. And we have a duration, and we need to get it to a number. Sometimes you have text numbers that need to go to a number, or dates or times. So we type number.from. And whatever it might be, if it can convert it to a number, it will. Click OK. And sure enough, there's the number of days. Now up in the formula bar, table.addColumn, it's acting on the previous step. There's the name of the new column. For each row, there's our formula. There are three arguments there. We want to go to the fourth one. Actually, before we go to the fourth one, since I don't really remember what the data type M code is for whole number, I'm going to go cheat, go back to Insert Year. And it's int64.type. Now, the funny thing is, most of the time for defining a data type, we use the keyword type, and then something like date for date, time for time, number for decimal. But we have to remember this. Come down to Add Custom. And we do want to do it in the fourth argument here rather than adding an extra step. So I click in the formula bar, comma. I'm going to type int. I see it right there. Tab, click at the end, and Enter. So we used number.from to coerce from a duration, just the number we want, and added a data type. Now, there's an easier way to do this if we really want to take the difference between two dates. But learning about number.from is important. I'm going to select end, and order in how I select the columns matter. So I'm going to select start second, add column. And over in the add column from date and time group, there's a bunch of awesome automatic formula options. So we say subtract days. And sure enough, table.addColumn, previous step, subtraction. We want to change that. But look at this, each and duration.day. So this is a very specific function to take the duration and convert it to days. It also put in the int64.type. I'm going to double click the second argument, number of days dd for duration.days. Enter. 
By the way, just for a second, I'm going to cheat up here. If I type duration, there's a huge list of duration functions that allow us to extract different types of time-related data from a duration. Backspace and Enter. Now, the next calculation we want to do is we want to take end, add some days, and get a new end date. Add column, custom column. We'll use new end date as the name, and we want to look at date. And look at this. We can add all sorts of different things. We want the first one, date.addDays. Two arguments. We'll take date, comma, number of days. There it is. Close parentheses. Click OK. And there we have from the very first day in history, we're going to add 12 days and get 113.0001. Up in the formula bar, comma. And this is where we use the keyword, because most data types just require this keyword. And then you have to know what the M code is. I'm going to type date, enter. All right, so the, the main thing we want to remember about different M code values, especially when we're doing lots of different date and time calculations, is if you're doing calculations on different data values, you got to be careful. Probably you got to look for a function that can help you. All right, so the first nine values we talked about, null all the way to duration, those are single bits of data. But now we want to talk about the Power Query M code values that contain multiple bits of data. We want to talk about table, record, and list. Let's go over to the query tables in column. Now to follow along with this section of the video, as we learned earlier in the class, the query we're about to use is pointing to an on-premise folder. So in Excel, you have to go to Data Source Settings, select the folder, Change Source, Browse, and you point Power Query to the video number 12 folder that you downloaded and unzipped. Click, Open, OK, Close. In Power BI Desktop, you go to Transform Data, and there it is, Data Source Settings, and the rest of the steps are the same. Now in this class so far, we've had many tables with columns, and in each row of this column, there is a table. And of course, one of the amazing things about Power Query that none of our other tools can do is we can actually have a column of tables and then use Power Query to transform them however we would like. Now, I imported these tables, and these are officially table values. I want to go over to M code values literal. This is a query I made. And in Applied Steps, I want to select Table, click the gear icon. Because guess what? That's how we hard code a table into M code. We start with pound table, open parentheses, and in the first argument in list syntax, and we'll learn about list syntax in just a second. List syntax just means I have an ordered sequence of values. These are the field names, and they have to be in double quotes. So we have two fields in this table. The second argument lists the records. And this is called a list within a list, because the first list, the outer list, it needs to know the ordered sequence of records, record one, record two. But because each record has multiple items, we need a second list. That's the element for the field boom product. That's the element for the field sales. All right, so that's how you hard code a table. Now, I don't think I've ever hard coded a table in any of my data analysis solutions. But you might imagine a situation where you have a small table of data, maybe something lookup that you want to hard code. I'm going to click Cancel, go back to Tables in Column. So table values, very common in data analysis, because tables are where we store data. Now, earlier in this class, a uh, number of times, we've had columns of tables, and we combined them. Remember, if we're going to combine these tables, each table in each row has to have the same structure, syntax, and field names. Uh, next video, we'll learn what to do if that's not the case. But that is the case here. Now, we've combined these tables a few different ways, but I want to show you a slightly different way. 
Now notice this is a table. It has a single column. We want to insert a step, so I click F of X. We're going to use that table to extract all the tables and combine them. But just for a moment, I want to look at the table.combine function and read the screen tip. It says, please give me tables as a list. This is not a list. It is a table with a single column. Now, we haven't learned how to do M code lookup yet. We'll learn later in this video. But if you have a table and you know the name of the field, we can extract or look up that column and return it as a list using square brackets. Now, square brackets in this context are called field access operators. Later, we'll see that there's some other uses for square brackets. But if we type the name of the field inside our field access operators, and that comes after a table. In fact, let me just delete this and prove that when I hit Enter, it returns it as a list. And that's what table.combine requires. So we'll put it back inside of table.combine, close parentheses, and when I hit Enter, bam, we have combined all those tables into a single table. All right, so we are going to encounter a lot of Power Query table values. Now, the next M code value we want to talk about is a record. And a record is whatever row we have in a table. Now, for our first example of a record, I want to add a column to this table and extract each record into a separate column. So I go up to Custom Column. I'm going to call this Record. And there's an amazing bit of M code that allows us to extract a record from a table in a custom column. And it's underscore. If I click OK, there it is, a record in each row, Aspen 34, Quad 500. And a record always appears with the field names and then whatever bits of data we have for each field name. Now, if you look up to the formula bar, here's table.addColumn. Custom, which is the previous step, we'll rename all those later. There's the name. And this is the formula we're running in each row. Now, each and underscore are syntactical shorthand for a custom function. We'll learn all about custom functions later in this video. You can think of each as, hey, I just need to do something in each row. And underscore, you can think of it as, please just give me the whole record. Now, for our second example, I want to go over to M code values, over to Applied Steps. And there it is, Record. I want to click the gear icon. And this is how you hard code a record in M code. Now, this is the second place we've seen square brackets. We're using square brackets to define a record. And when you're using square brackets like this, the field name inside does not need to be in double quotes, and it doesn't need that double quote and pound sign. But inside square brackets, we separate field name and data with commas. So here we have two field names and two bits of data. Now again, hard coding a value like this or creating a literal like this, I don't do it too often. But we definitely want to check it out and see it. One place you'll see this is in Microsoft Help for M code. Sometimes when they're dealing with records or tables, they'll show records this way. All right, I'm going to click Cancel. Go back over to Tables in Column. Now, the next M code value we want to talk about is a list. Let's add a new step. And up in the formula bar, we're going to type curly brackets 1, 2, 3, close curly brackets. Now, it sort of looks like array syntax over in Excel. But over here in Power Query, a list is defined as an ordered sequence of values housed in curly brackets. But there it is. There's a list. When I hit Enter, there's my list, 1, 2, 3. Now, it is different than the array syntax over in Excel because the array syntax in Excel can have rows and columns. We only have an ordered sequence of items in a list. I'm going to add another step. And lists are very versatile. I can have a number, comma, text, comma. I could have a list within a list. 
And in fact, I can put any of the M code values, including tables, records, and so on, into a list. When I hit Enter, now I can see down here, number text list. I can even click and see the list. Now probably the two best list tricks over here in M code are these. Curly bracket 1 dot dot 4 3 and curly bracket. This is equivalent to using the sequence function in the worksheet and telling it I want 43 rows. When I hit Enter, that is beautiful. 1 to 43 as a list. But here's something sequence can't do, at least not easily. Curly brackets, I want to go from A, and notice it's text, dot, dot, quote, M, get rid of that extra quote, and Enter. That is amazing. That's an amazing trick for lists. So we can do this with letters. We can do it with numbers. Of course, we can just type our numbers. And we definitely can have whatever different type of Power Query values we want in a list. Now, lists are very important in Power Query M code. Actually, as we've seen a bunch already, let's go back to Day Type Sales. I want to go to Grouping Rows. Here's Table.Group acting on the previous step. Well, there's a list, but it only has a single item. And in the third argument, this is a list within a list. And it defines the two aggregate calculations. And what's so nice is the outer list allows us to have multiple aggregate calculations. But within each aggregate calculation, we want to be able to define the name of the column, the calculation for each row, and the data type. We can also see with this example of a list why we're allowed to have different M code values in a list. Because in order to get all the details for this aggregate calculation, we need a text field name, a function, and a data type. Also, although a data type, which we've been throughout the class using the icon at the top of the column to define a data type, that sort of doesn't seem like a value, but it is. This list right here requires M code values. And because we want to be able to add a data type to an aggregate calculation, we're lucky that data type is defined as a value. So a list within a list, very handy. The question is, why is it that sometimes in Power Query M code, I see a single item in a list? Well, anytime you see a single item in a list in an argument, you know that that argument accepts multiple items. And since this is the grouping argument for table.group, it does allow more than one field for grouping. Enter. And right inside this formula is another reason we have to understand lists. All aggregate calculations like average, sum, require the numbers to be in a list. That's why every aggregate function that you look up We'll always say list dot and then whatever the calculation is. Now, one last quick example about lists. Here I have this step selected. I'm going to click F of X, insert a step temporarily. We're going to use our field access operators to access total sales. When we use our field access operators to go and get a particular column from a table, when I hit Enter, it always returns it as a list. And this is the form that numbers need when you do some sort of aggregate calculation. And they always start with list. And I'm going to do list.sum. And notice the argument says, hey, I need it as a list. And so that would just add up all of those and give us the grand total. Now I'm going to X this out, delete. All right, let's go back to tables in column. So in M code, we're definitely allowed table values record values, and lists. Now, the last three M code values are binary function and type. Binary represents a sequence of bytes. We've seen a bunch of binary items in columns, like Excel files, CSV, and text files. Functions, those are incredible, but that's two sections ahead in the video where we will define and create awesome custom functions. 
And as we just saw, type is a value in Power Query. That is the data type that we assign to a particular value. Now we want to be careful not to confuse M code data types with M code values. Now there is some overlap. Time is a value. It's also a data type. But data types are used on fields or columns to make sure we have consistent data in the column and that we can make the calculations we want in the load location. M code values are just the possible output when we use M code. For example, if we have the M code value number and we apply a data type decimal number, currency, or whole number, the result that we load will be different than the original data source. Now, let's go look at an example. In Power BI Desktop, here's the query, and I actually loaded this to the data model. Here in Excel, this is the source data. I've already loaded this. Let's open the query, and we can see the source. But if we change the data type to whole number, replace, and then load the output, and any formulas or calculations pointing to that data will change. Now, this is permanent as long as we don't change the data type in the query. And we can actually change it back to decimal because the source still has the decimals. If I open this up, data type decimal, replace, load. Sure enough, the output changes. As another example, if I change this mistakenly to data type text, replace, load, when I want to add alt equals, this data type is going to prevent the sum function from adding. Control Z, Z. That Control Z out here in the worksheet actually changed the line of code up in Power Query. Now our next topic in our M code adventure is, well, before I tell you what topic it is, I have two questions for you. I want to import this into the Power Query Editor. So I'm going to use our right click key G. And my first question is this. If I want to drill down to extract this, I go right click and drill down. Question number one, what in the world does that M code mean? Question number two, I want to come up to the source step. And what in the world does that M code mean? Both of those are examples of M code lookup. Now, before we see the syntax for M code lookup, those of you that know the index function, you already know how to do M code lookup. Because check this out the index function takes a table, then it says, hey, I need to know what row you want and column you want. It says, third row, second column, and it returns the intersecting value. Now, if we were doing this in Power Query M code and hard coding the row numbers in, this would be called row index lookup. However, most of the time, we want to be dynamic and point to an input cell using the match function that takes this value and dynamically determines a row. When we jump over to M code, when we do a dynamic lookup, it's called key match lookup. Now, over here in Excel, of course, we can look up a single value. We can also look up an entire row, and we can look up an entire column. Now, straight from page 13 in our PDF notes, here's the diagram for M code row index lookup and key match lookup. Now, for row index lookup, this is where we hard code the number into the formula. We start with the table. That's the identifier name for the table. Then in curly brackets called row positional index operator, we put the row index number. Now get this, Power Query is base 0. So row 1 is 0, row 2 is 1, row 3 is 2, and so on. We hard code the number into curly brackets. That will get us the row or the record. Then we use square brackets called field access operators with the field name inside. That determines the column position. Together we have a table, a row position, a field position, and bam, we get a two-way lookup. Notice the similarity to index. We have a table, then a row, then a column. 
Now when we do row index lookup, it's not dynamic. To do a dynamic lookup, we use key match lookup. Start with a table identifier, curly brackets to get the row position, and then inside we use square brackets to do the dynamic lookup. And these square brackets are called the lookup operator. Inside the lookup operator, we have a field name. And because we're putting a field name in square brackets, you don't have to put double quotes, the pound symbol, and you can have a space, field name equal, and then whatever the lookup value is. Now, one thing that's different about M code lookup is that unlike the Excel worksheet, we can't directly do approximate match lookup. We can only do exact match lookup. M code and DAX in the data model both have a hard time doing approximate match lookup. However, we'll definitely see a way to do it later in this video. But for exact match lookup, we can use this method to dynamically determine the row. Then following the row, we have our field access operator, field name, and that determines the column position. All right, we have row index lookup and key match lookup. We can extend these lookup techniques to look up just the row. We can also look up a list from a field. We can look up just the field. And in fact, we can even look up multiple fields simultaneously. All right, we're back in our lookup example. I removed that last step and renamed this step. We want to try some lookup. We're going to come up to the f of x. It will repeat the previous step name, and it is a table. Let's first see if we can look up a record. That means we use our positional index operator. And if I want to look up the first row, which means this record right here, Power Query is base 0, so I type a 0. When I hit Enter, there's a record. That's our first lookup. If we go back to our table, sure enough, that's the first record. But remember, we hard-coded that number in. If I come over and sort, ascending, I'm definitely going to insert a step. Now when I come back over here, I've hard-coded the first row in, so it gets the first row, which happens to be Aspen. Now I'm going to delete the sort rows. And we have the row. But now from that record or row, we can use our field access operator. If I type products and Enter, now I've done a two-way lookup, table, row, column. Now let's get rid of this, Enter, and see if we can try a key match lookup. So positional index operator, lookup operator. And I need to type products. That's the name of the field. Are you equal to? And we'll look up quad. Right now it'll just get the record and Enter. Now we'll go back to the previous step, a table. We'll sort ascending, click Insert. Now when we go back, it's still going to see quad. That is dynamic. No matter which row quad is in, it'll retrieve that record. We'll delete sort, delete. And now we can look up retail price and enter. Now we want to learn something important about key match lookup. Key match lookup really only works on a column that has a unique list. And if you think about it, over in Excel, lookup tables always have a unique list. If you don't have a unique list when you're looking something up, well, then you get into trouble. Now notice, supplier has duplicates. So we're going to come over, and we'll try and look up from supplier, gel booms. Hopefully, I spelled it right. Close with lookup, close with positional, and enter. And the message is polite. The key matched more than one row in the table. If, however, I change this, I'm going to ask for something that's not there. The sunset boomerang, when I hit enter, the message says, hey, the key didn't match any rows in the table. So just as over in the worksheet or in DAX, when we're looking something up in a lookup table, we want to do this kind of lookup on a column that has a unique list. Now, those are some important points about row index and key match lookup. But we got to learn about drill down with lookup and primary keys. I want to come over and right click Delete until end. Delete. Now, if we look up into the formula bar, Excel.CurrentWorkbook is a function that extracts all the objects from the current workbook. Now, we can read this lookup. For the row position, it's looking through a column called Name. 
It's trying to find lookup example. And then from the content column, it looks like it extracted a table. Now let's remove this, delete, and enter. And what Excel.CurrentWorkbook is doing is it's delivering a table with objects and the names for those objects. Now there are other M code functions that look into data sources, like an SQL database, and delivers a table with objects and names. So what we learn here about Excel.CurrentWorkbook will apply to many other M code data source functions. Now what we want to look at is drill down. If I want to extract this object right here, I can click and get a preview. I want to replace all of this with this table. So I right click, drill down. There's the table. If I get rid of this, look at that. It did key match lookup. Source, that's the table. It looked through that name column, found lookup example, and delivered the table from the content column. Now, when we did drill down, the reason it did key match lookup is because back over here, this table has a hidden primary key. For data sources and functions like Excel.CurrentWorkbook and other sources like SQL databases, when it delivers the table, the names of these objects are a primary key, which when you drill down, causes drill down to do a key match lookup. Now let's compare that to this table. Most of the tables we get in Power Query do not have a primary key. So what happens, even though this is a unique list, when I right click drill down, that's not key match, that's row index lookup. So even with something like drill down that doesn't seem like it's doing lookup, you got to know the difference between row index and key match lookup. Now the question is, how do you know when a table has a primary key? Well, it doesn't matter where you look in the user interface. There's no button to click to ask whether this has a primary key. Now, you're not going to have to do this often, but I am going to show you. I want to click f of x, and there's a function called table.keys. And if we put a table inside, when I hit Enter, it delivers a record. And it doesn't even tell me which column is the primary key, but it does say, Yes, there's a primary key. Now I'm going to X this out, right click drill down to do key match lookup. Now I want to show you how to add a primary key to a table. We click F of X, table.addKey, open parentheses. The first argument is a table, comma. The second argument is where you tell this function which column or columns you want to define the key. Now notice it says list. So even though we're going to define just one column as the primary key, we still have to put it in list syntax. Hopefully I spelled it right. There it is. We'll define that as the key, comma. And the third argument is true or false. And you put true if you want a primary key. Enter doesn't look any different. But when I right click drill down, it does key match lookup. All right, so that's a bunch about M code lookup. And really, the primary key thing is just so you understand what drill down does. And we will see a bunch of important lookups, including when we want to hard code and when we do not want to hard code in the next video. Now, I'm going to load this as a connection only. And now, our next topic is custom functions. Now, as we saw two videos ago in the Excel worksheet, when we want to create a reusable custom function, we use the Lambda function. Over here in M code, this is how easy it is. You start with parentheses, and you list any variables that you want. You can name those variables whatever you want. Then we use the go to operator. It's an equal sign greater than symbol. It looks like an arrow pointing from the variables over to the mapping of how we're going to use those variables. So we define x and y, and the mapping is x plus y. So whatever inputs we put for x and y, it'll simply add. Here's another example. We want to calculate the effective rate 
based on the inputs APR, annual percentage rate, and periods, number of periods per year. So we define in parentheses two variables, APR and periods. We put go to, and that's the mapping. That formula will calculate from APR and periods the effective annual rate. Now to learn the basics of building an M code custom function, I want to build a custom function in five different locations. The first is a substitute for a custom function, and that's in functions that allow the each keyword. We can build them as a new query. That gives us a reusable function. We can build them as a query step. We can invoke that query step in a custom column. And of course, we can build them in functions that have an argument that require functions. And the custom function we're going to build in all five places is based on our effective rate formula. Now here's our table, and each record is an investment. We have APR and number of periods. And in a new column, I want the effective annual rate. And of course, from finance, the effective annual rate is always going to be bigger than APR if the number of periods per year is greater than 1. Now, if we have a simple formula like we do here, and you only want to do it one time, there's no need to build a custom function, because we can go to Add Column, Custom Column. And this feature will use the table.addColumn function. And in the third argument where a function is required, it uses the each keyword. And each is a substitute for a custom function and much easier to use. Let's name this effective rate each. And our formula is going to require an exponent. But in M code, unlike the worksheet in DAX, we don't have access to that caret. So we have to use the function number.power. Right, so the base for our calculation is 1 plus APR divided by periods per year. That's the base of the number, comma. The power, that's the exponent, double click periods of year. Close parentheses. Now something very important, we just double click this field name and put this in, field access operators field name. Because we're using each, that's going to grab the value in each row as this formula is copied down. Now when we click OK, come up to the formula bar, at the end, I'm going to type a comma, and I want to define type number. That'll be decimal. Enter with the icon 1.2. And I see here that I did not subtract 1. This is 1 plus the effective interest rate. No problem. We come up to the formula bar. And right here, minus 1. And Enter. And now we have the correct annual effective rate. And sure enough, the effective rate, because all of the number of periods per year are greater than 1, all of these are greater than the original APR. Now in this example, we were just going to calculate this one time, so that's the way to go. But now, if we're going to use the same calculation over and over in this workbook, we want to define our own reusable custom function. And that means we create a new query. Right click, New Query. Other sources, and there it is way at the bottom, blank query. We don't type it up here. At least I'm not going to. I'm going to go to Home, Advanced Editor. I'm going to highlight all of this. I'm going to call this Effective Rate. And that's the identifier we're going to use. And because this is a let statement, we type an equal sign. And now we define the function. This is where we put open parentheses. And the nice thing here is I do want to name these because these will show up in a dialog box when we invoke this function. So I'm going to give them names that make sense. I might even call this periods per year if I was expecting someone to use it that might not know the difference between year and number of periods per year. But I'm going to use those. Go to number.power, 1 plus APR divided by periods, comma. This is where I put the power. And I can see it right there. I can actually hit Tab. But I'm always so afraid of IntelliSense and M code. Minus 1. Double click, because I want the query to return the actual function. There's one step. That's the identifier. Equal. There's our function. This is what the query is going to return. Click Done. 
I'm going to rename this over here, effective rate, and enter. We have it selected so we see this. But now I want to come over to Future Value Table, Add Column. We click Invoke Custom Function. The new column name, I'm going to call it Effective Rate Universal Function. And from the dropdown, all the different functions in this workbook will appear. We have Effective Rate, and we get to select. Now, sometimes it's on any. You switch it to Column if you want a column. It already guessed right. Here we want to say column name. By the way, this means you can put whatever you want, type something there, but we want a column. And we want periods per year. Now I click OK. And just like that, I have the same result. Now there's a couple other things we can do to a custom function. Right click, Advanced Editor. We can actually define data types. I'm going to define this as a number. That's for that first variable as number, two variables, each have a data type. And then directly after the open parentheses, but before the go to, I'm going to give the output from the function a data type also. I click Done. Now, the output from this is number. But of course, that's the value that's being delivered. We also want to add a data type, which of course we put comma in the end of this function. Remember, data types and values are different things. Click at the end and Enter. And we want to go back again, right click Advanced Editor, because there's a third cool thing we can do when we're building custom functions. We can add notes to a function. Actually, these notes can be added to any M code. When you do forward slash, forward slash, that's for a single line. Even though there's two lines here, I didn't hit Enter till I got there. If you want multiple lines, that means I hit Enter, Enter. Then to open, forward slash, asterisk. And to close, asterisk, forward slash. So we have our function with our go to operator. We've defined some data types, and we even added notes. Click Done. Future value table. And if we scroll over, we have used each because we were doing this calculation just one time. And then we built a custom function and invoked it up in Add Column because we were going to use it over and over in this workbook. The third option is to build your custom function inside the query itself as a query step. When you do that, the function's only available inside this query. Now, you might want to do that because you don't want a bunch of extra queries and a function query over here. Now, before we go to Advanced Editor and build our custom function, I definitely want to rename these steps. Once I've done that, right click Advanced Editor. All right, the first thing we want to do is the last line. Well, that's what the query is delivering. But this is no longer going to be the last line. So I type a comma, Enter. I want to add a note, so forward slash, forward slash. Now, there's no spell check in Advanced Editor. Hopefully, I spelled everything right. And this is where we're going to build a query step with an identifier that's the actual function. ER query FX, that's identifier, equal sign. And this is where we build our function. Now, I'm going to use variable names that don't need to be so descriptive because this function is just going to be working here as number. So I will be for APR, comma, N will be for number of periods. Those are the two variables. And for the function output, we'll define it as a decimal also. Go to the base will be 1 plus I divided by N, comma, N is the exponent, close parentheses, minus 1. We want to type a comma because we're not going to let that be the last step. We're actually going to use it. Now, here's the hard part, meaning I'm going to type out adding an extra column to the ER universal step. The new query step name will be ER invoke FX equal table dot add column. There it is, open parentheses. And because this is going to work on not the function step, but the step above. We're going to copy that. That's a full table. This function will add a column to this table, comma. The field name for the new column 
er query fx, comma, and this is where we're going to invoke our function. I'm using the each keyword, and the function we're going to use is just the formula that comes after each. er query, I see it right there, tab, open parentheses, and that's kind of cool. Up here in Advanced Editor, we get a screen tip. However, if we try to invoke this in a custom column outside Advanced Editor, we will not see this. The downside here is that we have to remember what the field names are and type them in Field Access Operators, APR, comma, Field Access Operator, periods per year. And then I definitely want the fourth argument, type number, close on table.column. I don't want a comma because I want to return this. Double click, copy the identifier, and after in, Control V. Click Done. And there we did it a much harder way. But if you don't want an extra function out here, and you're going to use it multiple times within this query, that's definitely an option. Now, if you really did have a function inside this query, and you were going to use it multiple times, the other way to do this is use Custom Column. We cannot use that because it's not a query, it's inside. But we can try and invoke it from custom column. We type the name of our custom function, open parentheses. And the advantage of doing it here is now I can just double click, comma, get both fields, close parentheses. And now when I click OK, it looks like capitalization matters. So capital ER, Enter. And if we scroll over, that will work too. Comma, type, number, click at the end, and Enter. All right, so if it's a one-time deal, we're definitely going to use each and just type out the formula. Universal, if we want a reusable function, that's the way to go. By the way, this step right here, it has that little information. There's the note I added. If we click the function, we can see that over here. Here's the function where we actually typed it in the advanced editor. And if I rename this, that's where we use the function specific to this query, but built the formula in a custom column. Now I want to go up to ER each. I'm going to copy this entire step, Control C, Escape. Come to the last step. Click F of X, highlight everything, and Control V. When I hit Enter, now we want to talk about the each keyword and look at how it is a substitute for a custom function. Now the first thing about the each keyword is it shows up in lots of M code functions like table and list functions where a function is required. The second thing is, is if we don't have it, then this formula is not going to be able to calculate in each row. In fact, if we don't have it, we get an error. If we put it back in, we don't get an error. Now to understand each, we have to think about Microsoft's definition. And their definition is a syntactical shorthand for defining an unnamed function taking a single untyped variable named underscore. And so directly, this is what each is replacing. Go to open parentheses to define a variable. There's the underscore. There's the go to. And when I hit Enter, it, of course, works perfectly, and that's what each is replacing. And that underscore should sort of make sense, because earlier in this video, we used each and an underscore to extract the record from each row in a table. So we're lucky that we don't have to type that out every time we want a formula to calculate in each row of a table. We can simply use each. Now, how is it a replacement for a custom function? Well, the third argument requires a function. Open parentheses, and you can call the variable anything you want. That's going to represent every row in the table. Then we go to, and the crazy thing is, for every field that we want to access in each row, we have to put that named variable directly in front of the field access operator. And so now, when I hit Enter, that's how each replaces a handmade custom function. So what this means is for a simple formula like this, we are glad that there's the keyword each. Now, in just a few moments, we'll see a formula 
that's going to calculate down every single row. And we can't use each. And so in that case, we will have to define a variable and put that variable in front of each one of the field access operators. Now I went ahead and added three steps to leave a trail here. There's the each. That's directly what each is replacing. And here's what each is replacing if we had to type it out by hand. Now our next example of a custom function is we want to go over to the dis discount table and look at how to do approximate match lookup. Now here's a lookup table. And over in F sales for each sales amount, we need to find an approximate match lookup and return the discount. Now, of course, in the Excel worksheet, this is simple. We just use XLOOKUP. But in DAX and in M code, there is no approximate match lookup. Now, we're going to look at two ways to do this. And the first way we're going to look at works both in M code and DAX. And if you have my The Only App That Matters book, in fact, when I teach you the M code for this, I immediately teach you the DAX also. But here's how the formula logic works. If we have a lookup value of 750 bucks, I'm going to ask the entire column, how many of you are less than or equal to 750 bucks? We'll get true and true. So the table will be filtered to show just the first two records. And then we'll extract the discount column. Because this is a table, we just use field access operators with the discount name. And it extracts it as a list. And then we'll use the function list.last. It'll get the last one. Now we're going to start off by going over to F sales, up to add column, custom column. I'm going to call it discount custom function 1. And for the time being, because I'm allowed to go and get any other query, all I'm going to do is reference this disk discount table. I see it there. This will return a table for every row. Click OK. If we look at the table, sure enough, we have the lookup table in every row. Now, there's a couple problems with this. One is, if we leave it like this, because this is an external query, Every time the formula needs the table, it has to go and get that table. And if you have a lot of records, that takes a lot of time. So I want to go over to Disk Discount. And actually, the second problem is I want to make sure this first column is sorted. Because if we're going to go and get the last value here, this better be sorted. So we're going to add a step, sort ascending. I renamed it. And now we want to go up to f of x. And there's the final table. That's this right here. And we want to buffer the table, which means load it into memory once. Then when we need the values, we use the values from memory instead of having to go back to the original query. We can use table.buffer, open parentheses, close parentheses, and enter. All right, I renamed both of those. Let's come over to F sales. And we want to come over and edit this formula. Remember, all we have is a table there. And that table is coming down every single row in the table.addcolumns function. But we want to open the dialog box. And what we need to do is filter the dis discount table. So of course, we're going to use a great function, table.selectRows, open parentheses. It needs a table. And then in the second argument, it needs a function. So I'm going to type comma. And then, of course, we want to try and use each because it's easier. But we're in big trouble already. This is a function. And we're going to put a logical test here that filters the sales column in disk discount. Remember, less than or equal to that 750. Well, that sales column is coming from here. This whole formula is iterating down every row in this table inside of table.addColumns. The two each's are going to be in conflict. Not only that, but what do I need to do? Inside of dis discount, I'm asking the question of a sales column. And as the formula goes down each row, I need to also ask the question of this sales column. So there's no way that we can use these two each's. This is a situation where we need to define a custom function. I'm going to open parentheses and call this inside table. That means wherever I use it, 
it's going to get the sales column here. And because I'm going to leave each out here, I can just reference sales with the field access operator. So it go to, and watch this, I'm going to cheat. What I really want is this, but it doesn't know how to differentiate between those two sales. So I put it in front of the first sales. Now the formula knows how to look in dis discount through the sales column and compare every single row to the sales in every single row from the outside table. Close parentheses, click OK. And you got to be kidding me. Look at that. It totally worked. There's that 774. Both of these get true because they're less than or equal to that 774. And now we just have to look up that last value. Now I'm going to edit the formula up in the formula bar. And we can see our table to extract a column as a list. I need to use field access operators with the name discount. So all of this right here, even though it's a function, it's actually a table. So right after the closing parentheses for table.select, square brackets, discount, hopefully I don't spell it wrong, and Enter. And now we have exactly what we want. We have a list. Now we can simply use list.last. After the each space, list.last, open parentheses. And notice it wants a list. And then after discount, close parentheses. And when I hit Enter, bam, there's approximate match lookup. And this is a good example of when in a custom column, in an argument that requires a function, we have to know how to create custom functions. Now I want to show you some alternatives for M code custom functions when we're doing approximate match lookup. I created some extra steps, but I went ahead and let's go up to Advanced Editor, and I added some formatting to make it easier to understand and compare. Here's the one that we just created. And because we're using two different back-to-back -back functions, table.addColumn and table.selectRows, that both use each and iterate over a certain number of rows, we have a conflict if we put each in the second function. So what we did is we kept each for the first function and then defined a custom function with a variable. Then when we got to our formula where we had two columns coming from two different tables, the it defined sales from dis discount and sales came from this table and table.addColumns. A slightly different approach, instead of using each in table.addColumn, I actually defined a custom function for the first function and the second function. The first variable I called OT for outside table. The second one, IT for inside table. Then it's easy to distinguish between the two sales column. It comes from this table. OT comes from this table up here. Still another way is to use the let expression. Remember, let just allows us to define variables. So within the scope of table.addColumn, I said, here's a new variable called sales. We're going to let it equal that field. And because it's in this scope, when we use the variable sales down here, it's automatically going to iterate and get each value from this table. That allows us to use the each keyword when we get to the second function. So we have sales in field access operators. That's coming from table.selectRows. And this variable that we declared using let, that comes from table.addColumn, this table right here. Now I'm going to click Cancel. There's another method, and this is from our pal Gert. If we click on this separate query, go up to Advanced Editor, he decided to use list.accumulate. And that's like the scan function we learned in MEX video number 10 when we talked all about Lambda. And this formula right here will calculate a little bit faster than the other three formulas we just talked about. And in the download zip folder, there's an Excel file called approximate match timing. And the timing and rankings are there for various approximate match lookup formulas. 
Wow, that was an epic M code video. And in this video, we talked about custom functions, both building them as part of a larger query or building a separate reusable function. We talked about each and underscore and how that is a substitute for a custom function. We talked all about M code lookup, including row index lookup and key match lookup. And we talked about the related topics, primary key and drill down. We talked about the heart of M code, which is understanding all the different values and how they work. We talked about different data types. We talked all about the let expression and the syntax for a let expression, understanding that by default, anytime we create a query, a let expression is used. But more importantly, the let expression is just like the let function in the worksheet. It just allows us to define variables and create some output. We talked about the three places that we can view, edit, and create M code in the Applied Steps pane, the Formula Bar, and of course, Advanced Editor. And of course, we talked all about how the amazing Power Query and the M code language that builds everything in Power Query is both in Excel and in Power BI Desktop. All right, if you like that video, be sure to click that thumbs up, leave a comment, and subscribe, because there's always lots more videos to come from Excel is Fun, more Max video, and this video is a full free course on M code. So tell all your friends, post the link to this everywhere, so this free lesson about M code gets out to all the Excelers and Power BI users in the world. Thank you.